Welcome, welcome everyone to Reboot the World. We are so excited to have Priya with us for How Gamers and Designers Rewrite Stereotypes. Take it away, Priya. Thank you, Jen. I am excited to spend some time with you all today. So depending on where you are across the globe, good morning, good evening, good afternoon. Um, I am coming to you today from Cincinnati, Ohio, and I am um, looking forward to this conversation with you. A little bit about how do we rewrite stereotypes. And before we do that, you know, I want to talk a little bit about how do we define stereotypes? Right? What is a stereotype when it's all said and done? And why do we care about it? Um, you know, so the first piece that I want to just highlight is this whole concept of who we are, how we are, and how we show up. And a lot of you are here today to learn, to grow, to share, to network, a lot of different reasons, right? So let's talk a little bit about that. And how does that come into, into play? So the first thing I want to do is just talk a little bit about stereotypes. Right? What are they? And why do they serve us as human beings? Why do we need them? Um, and you know, when we define what a stereotype really is, it's often something where we may have a data point or a limiting belief about a group of individuals, um, about a place, about a city, about just about anything. Um, and, and so part of this is, is really about something that we take and oversimplify and keep it fixed and hold on to it as it's near and dear to our heart. We just know deep down what we believe about this data point that we have about a group of people or individuals, or like I said, a city. That's one of my favorite examples, um, is, 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 is mine. I'm holding on to it. Um, and so part of, um, part of stereotypes really comes into play uh, is, Give me one second. I think we're having a tad bit of technical issues. So I just want to make sure I've got everything covered here for you. So if you could give me 30 seconds to make sure I get that squared away. The joy of technology, right? <laughs> As I'm talking to a group of folks that um that are all about technology so let me go ahead and see if i could i could reshare um my deck with you and if we can make this happen again so let's see how we do this all right so let's see if we um if we were able to make this happen um let me do a quick check in to make sure um Perfect. I think we might be right about online here just to make sure. Um, beautiful, beautiful. Thank you, folks, our amazing uh, tech support folks that are here making this happen and making us look good, by the way, just for what it's worth. So let's go back to it. So let's talk about stereotypes, right? Stereotypes, when it's all said and done, are these beliefs we may hold on to about a group of people, about places, about cities, about behaviors. They often tend to be very fixed and they tend to oversimplify. And I want to give you some examples here as we talk about how we can rewrite stereotypes and why do why don't I even hear talking about this topic today? So I have an image here I put on my slide. Hopefully you could all see it. And I want to give you just 30 seconds. And I know I can't hear you. You can't hear me. Oh, you can hear me. I can't hear you. But I want you to take these 30 seconds to reflect on what do you see in this image? What do you see? Now, depending on, again, what your worldview is, depending on what part of the world you're sitting in, your age, your, your industry, you may see a lot of different things. Some of you may say, well, it's a black and white image and I'm seeing a man. Some of you may say, I don't know, is it a man? I'm seeing what looks like a human being. Some of you may say, I see an old man. Some of you may even go further deep, deeper and say, I see an old man walking away. An old man that looks sad. He looks hunched over. These are all valid interpretations that you may have about what you see. And if you're multitasking and you haven't looked at my screen, take a second, look at my screen again. 
The question I would like for you to reflect on is, if you did not see a man full of energy, a man, as I like to often say, with more lung capacity than I have, why didn't you see that? What stopped you from seeing the possibilities in the image I shared with you? Why didn't you see a human being full of energy, full of life, playing music, sharing with others maybe? Because some people often say they see shadows. Why didn't we see all of that? What stopped us within ourselves? Now, if you are anything like me, there's a good chance you said to yourself or you said out loud, well, you didn't show me the whole picture. You didn't show me the other side of that image. You're right, I didn't. But how often do we live and operate in this world around us where we make assumptions based on what we see in the first glance? Well, that really emphasizes is how we make quick decisions as human beings. And we start making assumptions about things we see, places we go, experiences we have. And so the simple image just illustrates that when it's all said and done, we immediately go, as I like to often say, to our own benchmark. Your benchmark is what makes you who you are. So as you think about your life, whether you're a gamer, whether you play games, whether you code games, whether you're just a techie wannabe like me. And I'm so thrilled to be here with all of you today because I am with techies. At least that's how I feel I am. Again, maybe a stereotype at play. But think about that. Where do you go within yourself as you are engaging with the world around you? As you are coding, as you are designing, as you are planning, as you are ideating, you go to your own experiences. And what I want to do is share a little as we talk about this and give you insights on where do we get these stereotypes from? Because there's some value, by the way, in how, from a biology perspective, our brain is wired and how it allows us to be safe, how it allows us to thrive and make sure we survive at that very primal level. And I want to share a fable with you. This was a fable I grew up with, and I'll share a little bit about myself through that. So I grew up in India. I spent my formative years growing up in Bombay, India. And in my formative years, I heard this fable over and over again. And I'm always amazed on how it's informed me and how I have stepped away from this fable. But yet deep down, it shows up in my life in a lot of different ways. And I want you to be reflective of is as you think about your world, you think about the world as you walk on, um, on it today. What stories and narratives inform you, informing your worldview, informing the stereotypes you hold on to, informing how you work and play? So here's how the story goes. There was once a frog that lived in a well. It was a typical well. Again, this is where your imagination can come into play. It was a well full of bugs, some stagnant water, maybe some fresh water every now and then. It was dark, it was damp, it was cold. This frog was happy. It, it lived in this well. Life was good. But as frogs often do, they hop. One day, the frog hopped up so high, he found himself on the ledge of this well. As the frog sat on the ledge of the well for the first time in their life, the frog looked around. And this is where, again, imagine the most beautiful scenery a frog could see, if we can imagine what a frog could see. Right? The frog looks around and sees a beautiful pond. Lily pods, butterflies, dragonflies. The sun is shining, the clouds are white and fluffy, and the sky is blue. 
The frog looks around at all this, takes a couple seconds and thinks to himself. And before you know it, the frog makes a decision and jumps right back in into the well. Now think about that from your perspective just for a second. As I share this fable with you, where are you going in your mind? Where are you going based on your own experiences? What shortcuts are coming up for you? What's bubbling up for you personally? Because for me, as I think about this fable and how I was raised with this fable, the message I was given was to stay within my comfort zone was to not really venture out of the comfort that was created for me by my elders, for example. And there was a perception, a stereotype, a bias even, a shortcut that was planted that said, you know, all this other stuff out there, it's really nothing. And what I didn't tell you as I started to tell you that the frog thought for a minute was the frog thought to himself, and said to himself, there's really nothing out here, and jumped right back in to the dark, cold well. This story has informed me in a lot of different ways over the years. It's allowed me to recognize when I get too comfortable, when I might be shown something new, or be asked to be part of something new, or look at things from a different perspective, where I have chosen not to. I have to remember this story constantly to make sure I don't get complacent. How does this story tie into our conversation around rewriting stereotypes? Well, it's simplistic. We as human beings, from a very early age, I often go back to from the moment we are born, are being programmed. So here we are thinking that we are creating artificial intelligence and we are creating technology and games uh, and software and, and all these amazing things and programming. What we often miss reflecting on is that each and every one of us has our own set of programming. This programming was given to us from the moment we were born. Whoever raised us, raised us with what they thought was the right behaviors for us, right? So they taught us right from wrong, good from bad. They taught us how to behave. They taught us how to, um, how to show, our, show respect. For some of us, we even learned that if we didn't do our homework and if we didn't finish the vegetables on our plate, we couldn't get dessert. It's as simple as that sometimes. But we were being programmed. So as grown individuals, we often don't recognize or even reflect on how our programming, the programming that was given, through, uh, given to us by our own culture, by the elders in our environment. And this is where I'm going to add those of us, depending on what generation we grew up in, by the technology we were surrounded by, by the TV shows we watched, by the games we played. I will, let, I will date myself and share with you that I'm a girl of Donkey Kong era, right? I remember when the handheld Donkey Kong came out. That was my gaming for my generation at that point growing up in India. But that informed me. That informed, right? So how did I see and interact with what I was engaging with, whether it was on TV or whether it was in a handheld that I had for the first time? Not to mention Pong, right? Again, some of you are probably rolling your eyes and some of you are probably like, I have no idea what she's talking about. Right? But, what I, but that really highlights is, again, we are all a product of our environment and our culture programs us. So as we think about our roles, as we are creating um, our own programming, we are creating true programming from the perspective of technology, of games. Um, we are coding, we're ideating, we're designing new characters, we are creating storylines. How are your narratives coming into play? How are your benchmarks or your, specifically, your stereotypes that you may be holding on to coming into play? 
And I'm gonna illustrate that for you in a couple different ways here, as I give you an opportunity to reflect with me um, and engage. So be thinking about even just questions that are coming up for you, or what's resonating with you as I share this with you. Because as we dive into the Q&A section in a little bit, I would love to get some insights from you on how this feels to you. Have you ever thought about it this way? That as you are creating programs and, and programming games and coding, that you yourself are operating with a set of codes, with a set of programs that were embedded in you by others around you, by our society, by our elders, by our communities. We'll talk a little bit for a few minutes here about how we really make decisions. I've given you that fable that I shared with you. And by the way, I want to share with you what that fable is called in, in Hindi. Um, growing up, the way we say that in Hindi, it's called Kue Ka Mendak which translates into a frog that lives in a well. And I have been known in my family to call that out quite often. Um, I, I walk around calling people in my family frogs and my husband especially doesn't like it because when he doesn't want to change or when I am really pushing him out of his comfort zone, um, often, often I say, you're a kue kamenduk. And his response is, I'm not a frog, I'm a human. Yes, you are, but yet you're holding on to something that might, might not be true for you. Right? So how do, we, how do we make decisions? I'm gonna give you another quick analogy and I'm curious how this resonates with you. I like to use the analogy of our mind, our brain as that of a filing cabinet. And in this filing cabinet, we have all of these data points that we have tucked away. And you've got things like your values and your beliefs and your strengths and your preferences. You know, all of those things you were taught, all of the things you believe. Um, and, and by the way, you also have your education here, right? Because just about anything that makes you who you are is all tucked away in here. The reason we care about this filing cabinet, which is our amazing mind that we could do amazing things with, is because these folders that we have in our mind often control our thoughts and emotions. They impact. So even as you're experiencing this today, you've had so many choices as you've gone through, um, gone through the experience um, of these different sessions that have come up for you, things that you could choose to sit through today and yesterday and tomorrow. You are putting everything that you're taking in and comparing it to those folders. So every single thing, every speaker you've listened to, you have taken what they've shared with you and compared it to a file folder you have and said, oh, I like it, I don't like it, do I believe it? I don't know. In some cases, you've held on to your own folder. In other cases, you've probably added some things. But remember, this is happening all the time for each and every one of us. But it's happening so fast that we don't think about it. We don't recognize that it's even happening. We care about these thoughts and emotions because what they do is they give us the insights that then turn into behaviors and actions. And part of what starts to happen is with the, all of these folders that we have, we access them so quickly that we don't even know we are holding on to certain folders. I'll give you a very quick example, and then I'm going to have you reflect again for a couple seconds. I have a 11-year-old um, child now, and um, I, when she was a baby, she was probably a couple months old, I was just engaging with her in baby talk. And I'd lived in this country at that point for about 20, 20-some uh, 20 years. And I'm sitting here engaging with her, playing with her, and I say something to her in Hindi. And as I say it to her in Hindi, this, if it's supposed to be a term of endearment, I was just playing with her, picking at the cheeks, just being cute, baby talk, but doing it in Hindi. As it came out of my mouth, it was the first time it had come out of my mouth in about 20 some years, because I hadn't been around children in that long time. I'd been around children when I was in India. And as it came out of my mouth, and I heard what I was saying in Hindi, and tying it back to what it meant in English, I had a full-fledged emotional breakdown. Because what I realized is what I was repeating from one of my file folders that I didn't know I had 
was so disrespectful to a certain group of individuals. It was a stereotype, in essence, that I was repeating to my child, which in a way, again, going back to programming, I was going to be programming her with that statement, with that term. So I say that to say these file folders may seem like things that we take out and we all know what we have, but more often than not, we are holding on to things that we think we have taken out, gotten rid of them, shredded them, whatever the case might be, taken them to the recycle bin. We have really not done that yet. Which is why it's important for each and every one of us to recognize what beliefs do we hold on to and how do they show up in the work we do and how we engage with each other. So real quick, for 30 seconds, I want you to think. Think about a game, a favorite game you may have, a game you enjoy to play or a show you like to watch. Who is the hero? Think of the hero. What does the hero look like? Who is the hero? Or who is the one that's saving the world or the main character in that game or in that show? Who is the villain? Who's the bad person, bad guy, bad gal, whatever the term might be? And I want you to just for your own self reflect on it through the lenses of diversity. What was the race of the villain as compared to the hero? or the heroine for that matter too. How tall were they? How short were they? What was the age? Did they have gray hair? Did they have short hair? Did they have natural curly hair? What was the body type? Was the body type lean and fit? Or was the body type leaning towards the other direction? In a matter of 30 seconds, wherever you went, you immediately went to a place that is your default, right? As I like to call it, your default, your benchmark, your quick, short access stereotype, whatever that might have been based on what you've experienced in that game, in that show, in that movie. Now, this doesn't make us good or bad people. So my intent here is not to say, well, if you have that, that something's wrong with you. Not at all. The reality is, is that we as human beings, at least what biologists tell us today, really don't have the bandwidth. We don't have the RAM to process all the things we need to process on a given day. And because of that, our brain finds it important to start to create shortcuts. So we create these shortcuts that in essence become stereotypes that are very limited. I experienced this once. My brain said, I know what it is. So the next time it shows up, I'm jumping straight to that stereotype. I'm not even gonna see if there's new data that can come in because I'm operating so quickly. And this is also where we start to create those biases. Right? The biases where we make decisions on how are we going to see people that might be different than us. And those differences can be across any dimension of diversity. Going back again to what maybe came to your mind when you saw the image of the man I shared with you, or some may call it the old man that I shared with you, or when you thought about the villain, or you thought about the hero or the heroine of the show or the games or the, or the movies that you reflected on. The reason we care about this, again, going back to rewriting stereotypes, because when we talk about influencing and we talk about impacting the world around us and we're talking about rebooting, well, how do we reboot the world? Well, we can reboot the world if we first acknowledge for ourselves how we are programmed. Because we can't go reboot something if we don't even know how we are put together and what our own programming might be. So the analogy I like to share here as we reflect on this a little bit more is for most of us, we believe, that we are very conscious in our decisions. Our beliefs are very conscious. Like I am very inclusive. I care about people, whatever those narratives might be for each and every one of us. The reality is, you know those fables I shared with you? My, my frog, my kue kamenduk, and that file cabinet analogy from a perspective of our brain, our mind. The reality is that our subconscious beliefs, which tie into our subconscious mind, 
which is your filing cabinet, is a million times stronger than your conscious mind. So let me break it down a little bit, just to add a little bit more context and make this more fun. Right. Our subconscious mind is the one that works on autopilot. Right. So you're you're sitting here, you're listening. You might be watching this on a on an um, on an uh, on a mobile device. You might be taking a walk while you're doing it. You could be jogging, running. You could be sitting. You could be doing a lot of different things. You're doing all those things while you're listening. Maybe as you're seeing the screen. You're not really stopping to think about how do you sit. You just know how to do it. That's your subconscious mind. It already knows what you need, what data points you're looking for. If you're sitting in a chair and you're uncomfortable, you're going to adjust yourself. You're not going to stop listening to me and adjust yourself. You're going to do it naturally. That is your subconscious mind. That's where your subconscious beliefs come from. Those data points you have in your folder, your file cabinet, your sh shortcuts in essence, where you don't stop and think. Your conscious mind or your conscious beliefs are things that come to you when you're not thinking. So if you truly are sitting right now and if you're one of those individuals that loves to take notes or write thoughts down as you hear things, your conscious mind is engaged right now because you're actively engaging. But here's the catch. When you finish your session today or you finish listening to this um, cast today, are you going to go back on autopilot? Right? So researchers tell us that 95% of decisions we make as human beings, as individuals, comes from our subconscious mind. So that autopilot, that filing cabinet, the place where we have all the data points that we think we got it figured out. Our conscious mind that we feel that we operate from most times is only used about 5%, maybe 10% if you are really good at it. And by the way, this is a reason why when you are in the shower or when you are not thinking, you come up with those brilliant ideas because you are not on autopilot. And this is also why a lot of us could probably relate to the fact that we can go from point A to point B. There's probably been days you've gotten in your car and you've driven to wherever you needed to go, but you don't remember the drive. But you know you got there safely. You know you stopped at the traffic lights. You know you swerved when that car came by. You know you, you'd made the left turn when you needed to and the right turn when you needed to. Well, who was making all those turns? It wasn't your conscious mind. It was your subconscious mind. So our subconscious mind is super powerful. And it also then impacts how you do your work, how you engage. When you are creating characters, when you're creating storylines, where are you going to your default? Who is in your benchmark? Who is always the villain? Who is always the hero or the heroine? What's the physique look like? What does their features look like? Hair, tall, short, all of those things come from a place of stereotypes. Again, another simple, silly example for you to reflect on. I've already said to you, I grew up in India, lived in this country for 27 years. And I have often been accused of being, as they refer to, a token Indian. Now, I know that can come across as disrespectful, but really what, the way I interpret that is what I am being told by some of my colleagues is the fact that I don't fit the stereotype that they may have of an Indian woman. In their mind, a woman from India needs to behave a certain way, dress a certain way, talk a certain way. And I don't fit that narrative. Right? Now, they're saying it jokingly because they think it's cute and funny. But that's a stereotype that you're asking me to fit back in a box. I'm an individual. And yes, I don't fit a lot of stereotypes just as a data point. right? Because if you're trying to stereotype me as an Asian woman or as an Indian woman, there's a good chance you might, you might think I'm in the wrong field. Because guess what? I'm not smart enough to be an engineer. I'm not smart enough to be a lawyer. And I am not a doctor. Those are some stereotypes that go with women from India. Because, you know, 
That's what we Indians are often are. And I get that, by the way, in interactions I have with strangers when I travel the world. People often ask me if I'm traveling for work or for pleasure. And when I say I'm traveling for work, they say, oh, wow, are you a doctor? And I often joke and say, I don't wear a lab coat when I travel. And no, I'm not a doctor. And then people stop and say, well, you must be an engineer then. No, I'm not an engineer either. Right? Why are people doing that? Because they are going to the quickest, easiest default they have of someone that looks like me with my background. Now, what I'm giving you in full transparency are some positive stereotypes. Because I am Indian, I'm Asian American. And the stereotypes that often go with me, with my race and my ethnicity, could be positive. I want you to reflect on our colleagues that might be of other races, ethnicity, sexual orientation, age, physical, mental ability, appearance, that might not have those positive stereotypes. So the question becomes, what can you do? What can you do as we talk about transforming the planet? What can we do as we talk about rewriting stereotypes? What does that mean? What does that look like to us? So I want to share some tips with you on what that can potentially look like. Because again, as you think about how you entered this space today, why you are attending this amazing campus party, this virtual campus party across the globe. What are you hoping to get out of it? What do you want to do with it? I want you to reflect on your sphere of influence. Think about what is, first of all, your sphere of influence. But before you even dive off of that conversation into how you can influence others, I want you to think about what is your sphere of control? Who do you control? What do you control? Now, most individuals say when I ask that question on what do you control or sphere of control, as we control ourselves, like I control my behavior, my actions, my thoughts. Now, I'm going to be a little vulnerable here. So please play along with me. I'm an extrovert. And here's what I'll tell you about my sphere of control when it comes to controlling my behaviors consistently. Doesn't happen. Here's why I say that. Because for me, often, my mouth can get the best of me. Okay? So I often call it my runaway train. I say something, and as it's leaving my mouth, my brain is catching up saying, shut up, Bria, shut up. You shouldn't have said that. Now, I'm not sure if any of you can relate to this or how this even feels to you listening to me. But the reality is, it just reinforces the fact that I am operating from that subconscious level more often than I might realize. I am operating with that filing cabinet of mine that has all these files in it. Right? Whether it's a digital filing cabinet or an actual physical filing cabinet, if folks have those these days. Right? I am operating from it and not even recognizing it. Because I say it, and then I have to figure out how I'm going to back it up. So the question that I want to ask you again as you think about what can you do to rewrite stereotypes, as you think about transforming the planet, and as we think about imagining the world of tomorrow, it starts with you. It starts with each and every one of us to recognize our own sphere of control and our own programming. Not to be judgmental about ourselves or judgmental about why we believe what we do. Rather look at it as, here's my programming. And when I am creating things or I'm engaging with others or I am developing things, I am bringing my programming to every interaction. Because only then can we move from our sphere of control once we figured out what our lenses are 
to moving to a space where we can then use what we know, what we believe, what our platform is to create that change, to create that sphere of influence that can impact others around us, maybe in a positive way by rewriting stereotypes. Rewriting stereotypes means maybe every time we talk about a villain or every time we talk about, um, a about a hero, we're not going to the default. And I realize this is the global conference and we could be all over the place. Every culture has a default. In the US, our default may be a white or Caucasian white male, tall, good looking, chiseled chin, right? Beautiful eyes, well built. That could be our default in the US. In the Philippines and China and Singapore, that default may look different. But there's still a default that is based in on some stereotype that everybody should fit in a box and look this way or behave this way. How does that show up when we talk about religion? How does that show up across different ethnicities? And so part of this is we think about rewriting stereotypes. It's about taking that control again and looking within. Looking at your sphere of influence then. How are you creating storylines? Now you're gonna do all of that if you choose to do any of this. But here's what's going to start to happen. A reality check for most of us will be the fact that to do anything, to do impact change, if you look within and you identify some things that you agree you may want to change, it's your decision. You're going to have to reconcile with your innate need for comfort. Because for most of us, if not all of us, I try not to speak in absolutes. We as human beings desire and crave comfort because comfort means I don't have to think about it. Comfort means I can do it without thinking. Another way of looking at that is comfort is unconscious competence. That means you can act without effort. You don't have to think. If you are sitting listening to this right now and you have an itch, you're just going to itch. You're not going to stop listening, think about it, and say, I should move my hand and I should itch. They're acting without effort. For any change to happen, we have to leave our comfort zone. Just by acknowledging at your conscious mind level that you will rewrite stereotypes or you need to rewrite stereotypes or be more mindful will give you zero results. Until you leave your comfort zone, and practice what you truly want to do, what you truly want to create. We refer to this as the learning zone, right? And that learning zone, by the way, shows up in a lot of different ways, right? Learn a new game, uh, play it the first time, I can't even get past level one, I learn, I practice, I take it in, I internalize it, I figure out how to get through, get through stage one, I master it. So I get to a place of unconscious competence, comfort zone. And then I go to the next level and that's a challenge and I go to the next level. But you also know that there are some of us, and those of us who might be gamers wanna be, that we may get to that comfort level and then we get so, so comfortable that we really have no desire to make it to stage two, stage three and stage four. We just hang out where we are because it feels good. The learning zone is where we can go practice. The learning zone is also very scary because it, you have to go within, do a lot of reflection, and then figure out what am I going to do differently. Our goal through this process, though, is to make sure you don't go into your panic zone. Your panic zone is where the anxiety is high, the stress is high, and often we can do nothing. I want to take you back with this image to the fable I shared with you. A frog in a well. If you reflect on it through those lenses, that comfort zone really is the frog in a well. It's a dark, damp well. It works for the frog. It's what the frog has always known, entire life. Frog jumps out on the ledge. It's an opportunity for a learning zone. 
opportunity to look around and see, wow, I don't have to be in this dark, cold hole. And look, there's other frogs and the abundance of nature and bugs and everything that frogs crave, maybe. My interpretation, never talked to a frog before. But on that ledge is a decision-making point. Do I dive back in to the comfort zone? Or do I maybe jump out of my comfort zone into this learning zone that I'm kind of teetering on? And yes, I may be in my panic zone for a few seconds because my anxiety might be high and I might not be sure what to do, but I'm going to do it. In my humble opinion, I don't think we can reimagine the world of tomorrow if each of us in our own way doesn't leave our comfort zone. And again, each of us decides how much we want to leave our comfort zone, how much we want to teeter between comfort and learning. And by the way, for some of us, we love adrenaline rush. We may just jump off the panic zone and be absolutely okay. But the, the key here is, are you a frog that chooses to live in a well? When new data comes your way, do you stick with the data points you have because you believe them so wholeheartedly? Or are you open enough to recognizing that there might be an opportunity to look at things differently? In this case, maybe rewrite a couple stereotypes. So what can we do, right? We've got our sphere of influence we've talked about. We've talked about, you know, looking at our own comfort zone, learning, lower learning zone and working our way out. The key is stretching our comfort zone. So if we discover some negative stereotypes that we might be holding on to, ask yourself, why are you holding on to them? What informs those stereotypes? Are there counter data points that might show up for you? Are there opportunities to maybe gather more data? And by the way, as you think about this concept of stepping out of your comfort zone, at no point the goal is that you take your own values and beliefs and throw them out the window. I like to put it as it's important to take stock of your own values and beliefs and then see how they impact others around you how they impact those that you are trying to influence. Are they impacting them positively or negatively? Ask others for feedback, right? Because each of us lives by our values and our beliefs. And so again, just a couple, couple data points to think about. The biggest piece I wanna highlight here is as we think about it is the unlearning the old and unproductive behaviors. Because one of the things going back to, again, how we are programmed as human beings, as we are writing programs for games and other, other uh, technologies, is we don't recognize that we may have programs in our own system that might be outdated. We could still be operating on a, um, on a platform that's a legacy platform that may really not support the image of tomorrow, what we wanna imagine for tomorrow, how we wanna transform the planet. Because we really can't transform the planet if we keep thinking with the same ways we have thought before. So how can we push the envelope? Well, we can push the envelope by not just pushing others around us, but first looking inwards and recognizing where are we coming from? and then identifying ways in which we can continue to push others and use our sphere of influence. And I often even like to throw in the concept of use our own privilege. If you have been given a, a seat at the table, a privilege to design something, to create something, how can you use your voice to change perspectives, to change minds, and if nothing else, to change hearts along the way? So rewriting stereotypes, is about recognizing that. It's about recognizing that for a very long time, we have operated from some very limiting beliefs. And this goes across every culture across the globe. In the US, I know specifically, we started the last several months having discussions even more about race. And that has now rippled effect into the all across the globe for that matter. We've seen protests all across the globe. 
So the question becomes is, how do we take stock of our own worldview? Recognize where we are coming from, the impact of it, and then identify ways in which we want to help change the world. Because if you have a platform, how do you help rewrite certain stereotypes that might exist across race, that might exist across religion, that are often re reinforced, the negative stereotypes are reinforced in a lot of mainstream media technology. There's a bias in everything around us. And the only way we can do this is if we start by rebooting our own benchmark. And for me, rebooting doesn't always mean we're dumping everything and starting afresh, right? All we're doing is restarting and saying, all right, what programs are working? What codes are working? What do we need to take out? And how do we make it all come together? Is this a legacy piece of data that we are holding on to, that I'm holding on to? that does not serve me anymore? And do I need to pivot? Because until we don't, we don't pivot, it becomes very difficult for us to help others do that. So I'm gonna encourage you today to think about how you can use your own platform. And a lot, of has, been, a lot has been shared in lots of different ways and forums, even here at Campus Party Digital, on what you believe you see and you create, right? What you believe, you see and you create. And this is one of my favorite images to share because I think we are all guilty of it. I'll be the first one to raise my hand, is we all see the world as we are, right? So this rhino painting this amazing scenery, but there's always something in the way. So can you take that moment? Can you take your, your, your insights, whatever your conscious mind is picking up today, and take some time to reflect as to what is it that is in your subconscious mind, those stereotypes that you are operating from that inform everything you do, how you engage. So this is not even about just the programming side of it. But how do you engage with your team members? How do you engage with others around you? How do you engage with your global teams, your colleagues? Are there perceptions and stereotypes that are coming into play? Part of what I want to, to encourage you as we open the floor up for some questions is to reflect on really how you can use your platform to rewrite stereotypes to create new stories, new narratives, to recognize where you might be that frog in the well that might have opportunities and where you may need to overcome your own personal fears, your own narrative, to help others see things from a different perspective. I truly wanna thank you for spending some time with me um, today. I really hope at least one thing that I shared with you resonated uh, and that you could take back with you. Um, and Jen, I just want to check in to see if there are any questions that, are up that we could address. Um, so right now, let's see. Um, so for all of our campus arrows who have been um, watching us, just make sure that you type in your questions in our chat. Um, we do have our first one for right now, and it is a two-part question. So first part, what specific things can I do to rewrite the stereotypes? And the second part of the question is, and can you provide any tactical or practical examples for us? Yeah, absolutely, um, absolutely. So, you know, the first piece of that is how can we really rewrite our stereotypes? Um, you know, it really comes by doing some internal reflection. So what's critical is for each and every one of us to take some time. So depending on, again, you know, what your worldview is, what part of the world, country, city you live in, to reflect and say, who am I surrounded by? And when I'm using language, even when I'm engaging with others around me, what are some specific patterns that I'm noticing? Maybe you can narrow it down and be very specific and say, you know, I'm going to focus on gender differences. So when I am engaging with someone of a different gender, what are some of the internal narratives or shortcuts I have? that I go to as a default? And why do I feel that way? 
right? Um, often we see this in tech uh, industries, right? Where, where again, we talk about the gender mix, we talk about race and ethnicity mix, um, and some of the lack of diversity. And we start to notice, so as a woman, I'll use myself as an example, um, you know, depending on the rooms I'm in, if people don't know who I am or what my role is, I'm often leading or facilitating dialogue. Um, and I am mistaken as being there to help set up the room or, um, or for that matter, make coffee or bring coffee. Right? So, so again, in that couple seconds when people walk in, do they really like are intentionally trying to be mean or be negative? Well, not really, but they go to a shortcut immediately and they make a decision from it, right? So it's more of identify a dimension of diversity, as I'll put it. So pick something that you're surrounded by and then start to notice your own behaviors and narratives. And one of the best things to do, by the way, if you're open to this, is truly asking others around you for feedback around that dimension of diversity. So you may just say, you know what, I'm doing some work on myself and I want to, you know, how do I do I work differently with my male colleagues than I do with my with my female colleagues? Um, and then be open to the feedback you get. Um, I think that's a great way to at least get started um, on the on the conversation. And then the second part of that, Jen, on what do you, you know, how do you rewrite it? Often we say, look at whatever your stereotype is about a certain group, look at opposing images right so in your mind if you if you believe a, a a hero or a heroine looks a certain way look at opposing images and see why they cannot be your hero or your heroine right because what you're doing really is starting to create those short connections um, from a perspective of our brain again where you're like oh wait so the shortcut doesn't always have to be this this image, it can also be another interpretation or another um, image for that matter. So again, there are several different ways. And if nothing else, just for the fun of it, I'd like you to go, um, you know, whatever search engine you use and Google uh, professional uh, professional hairstyles. Uh, you could Google um, um, uh, women at work. Um, see what kind of images show up. You'll start to notice there are some stereotypes that often uh, start to show up, um, specifically when we talk about professional um, hairstyles. Um, you'll start to see more, more uh, what I'm gonna say specifically, again, US-centric example is um, women with, with you know, uh, clean, what we consider in the US, kind of clean, short hair, flattened hair. Um, a lot of our African-American colleagues will say this too, that you know, the stereotype is that uh, as an African-American woman, if you have curly hair, it's not looked at as being very professional. And recently there was a Google search done and you can see the disparities on professional hairstyles and unprofessional hairstyles. And you'll see how that goes across race and ethnicity. So again, those are some great ways to start to assess yourself, but then also think about how do you rewrite those stereotypes? Good, good advice. So um, another question is, so let's say you're working with somebody who has just so certain stereotypes ingrained in them. Um, how do you how do you work with them? How do you work with them around these and still, you know, make it a, make it a successful project? Oh, yeah. How much time we got, Jen? <laughs> <laughs> make it quick and make it make it easy. <laughs> there you go. It's a great question. So thank you for asking, though. Um, you know, the reality is we all have blind spots, right? So um, simplistic answer would be is, you know, if you have a relationship with that person enough to just try to maybe ask them versus accuse them of having certain biases or stereotypes, um, ask them the why. You know, I noticed the last two projects you had, you gave those two projects to a male colleague. I'm just curious, you know, why didn't you give it to to Susan, who was who was just as competent and come from a place of curiosity? Because the thing with this work is if you come from a place that you have it figured out and you're going to tell everybody else what to do, it doesn't work well. So come from a place of curiosity to first seek to understand what stereotypes they're holding on to and maybe the why behind it. And then part of what that may do for you personally is it'll inform you on where they are coming from, so you can then come up with your strategy on how you may need to navigate that relationship. Cool. 
Well, that's really good advice. Um, that's all the questions that we have right now. So thank you so much, Priya, for your presentation. Um, it was very insightful, very educational. I hope a lot of campus arrows are able to implement those into their own mindset. Absolutely, and thank you for having me. Thank you. Of course, thanks everyone for watching. Um, and then we'll just do a shout out to our sponsors. Have a great day, everyone. Bye-bye. Grand Valley is a teaching university and it's focused on the student and yet we have research university quality facilities. Grand Valley is very focused first and foremost on the education of our students. The style at Grand Valley is very hands-on. You work directly with the profs in smaller classroom settings. So it's a really open environment, a lot of discussion in the classrooms. We're also really able to apply our skills and our knowledge that we've learned at Grand Valley to make somebody's life better.